Good morning. Uh, it is Thursday, April 20th, and welcome to the Education and Culture Committee. We're, we're back again today and uh, continuing our work on the operating budget in, in the CIP. Uh, and we have uh, six items today. The first is uh, with our dear friends and colleagues at Montgomery College. So come on down. You're the next contestants. <laughs> exactly. Um, and appreciate Dr. Williams and Mr. Colette and all the whole the whole great team uh, from Montgomery College. So uh, this morning we are going to talk about uh, your operating budget request, which as usual and in line with many your predecessor and, and now solidly under you is, is always uh, reasonable uh, and fiscally responsible. Uh, and we get you know, our bang for our buck uh, with Montgomery College. And, and we've, we've been seeing you a lot this week and just want to continue to thank you for all that you're doing for our students. Uh, the testimony that many of them and former students, current administrators, teachers have given during the testimony. I always look forward to the Montgomery College testimony because you know you're going to either need a tissue or you're going to smile uh, or probably both because of just the, the work that you all are doing in their lives. So um, we really appreciate your commitment. You're a key partner uh, in our educational ecosystem and in our economic development strategy. Um, and. Uh, we all realize that, and uh, as we, I think we've all talked about it in various ways. Um, so we'd love to hear, just Dr. Williams, I'd like to allow you to make any opening comments you want to make, and then we'll turn to staff and have you on your way. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chairman Jamondo. Thank you, committee members, always great to, to see you. <laughs> um, I just want to start off, we won't take uh, much of your time today, uh, as much of the time as, as you would like. Um, I won't take much. Um, I would start off with some, some good news just to, to share in terms of we think about access to education and we sometimes term that in, in enrollment and we actually met for this year we exceeded our enrollment projections um, which is which is great we actually saw an increase of uh, a little more than 10% in our first time in ever college students in that cohort just to give you some perspective that cohort is about 3200 students so a 10% increase is a decent number of, of, of students. Um, one of the other uh, spots of good news in terms of access to education is spring over spring, spring 23 compared, compared to spring 22, we saw an increase. And we haven't seen a spring to spring increase since 2012. So since 2012, and these are exciting times. A, a lot of the effort that has been put forward and dedication to looking at access to education is really paying off, and we want to continue that. And um, more good news, and thank you, Chairman Juanda, for uh, for uplifting this. The, the the reasonable budget we sit before you with a uh, a maintenance of effort budget. Uh, we are not asking the county for for any any new dollars. Um, the uh, board was you know, very fiscally conservative and thinking about the future when uh, really approving this budget. I do want to share that, and I'm sure everyone knows, but just to, to reiterate, um, the maintenance of effort is extremely important. Uh, it does allow Montgomery College to receive state aid. Um, and this year, based on the CAID formula and our enrollment, it's actually $5 million of additional money from the state. So the maintenance of effort uh, request, while reasonable and fair, it's very important. And that's why we're here seeking your support. And that's why I'll share a little bit more about what this budget means. It does keep tuition affordable. There is a modest 2% uh, tuition increase. We have not seen a tuition increase at Montgomery College for three years. This 2% is well below in inflation. Um, and we've also provided opportunities for scholarship dollars to help with that adjustment as well. This budget will provide fair and reasonable increases for our faculty and staff who help create the awesome educational and academic support opportunities for our students. And it will um, also renovate 2221 Broad Birch, our ECE, our East County Education Center. Um, we are not asking the county for any new dollars to do that. We are on target to have that open sometime in fall that will you know, provide lab and classroom spaces that lend itself to 
um, cybersecurity and IT, early childhood education, entrepreneurship. We're deep in conversations with WorkSource Montgomery so that they can have a space at the East County Education Center. Um, so we're, we're very excited. The budget does provide us with funds to continue the campus planning. So while we're, we are opening the East County Education Center, we're simultaneously planning for that campus. That's, a, that's some years out, but we're aggressively looking towards, towards the future. So that's a, another piece of, of the component. I, um, I, I could share with you things that, that you know and you know, how your support goes to the 40,000 approximately you know, students and residents who we're, we're serving every year, the more than 1,500 duly enrolled students who are in MCPS and Montgomery College this year. Um, last year we had about 260 plus of those students actually receive their associate's degree a few weeks before they received their MCPS high school degree. Yes, so um, you know some of those students are actually in the nursing program and when they're done in that two years they have one more year before they become a nurse. So I'm gonna, share with you the 770 students that we have in cybersecurity um, who are ready to go and fill a job at day one after they earn their degree. But I will leave you uh, just with one, one, one story. I know you've heard a lot of testimonies, but I just um, share a story about Jackie. Jackie Flores, who like many alumni, she grew up here. Ms. Flores grew up here, she went to school here, and now she works here. It's so like so many of our graduates from Montgomery College. After graduating from Quince Orchard, she chose MC to be her best opportunity for post-secondary education to earn her associates in biotechnology. Um, she then transferred to UMBC uh, at USG where she earned a bachelor's degree and today she's employed at AstraZeneca as an operations manager in cell therapy. So just to share that, so you have a, another testimony kind of via me um, in terms of the impact that Montgomery College has. We uh, remain extremely grateful for your continued support and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairman Jamondo. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And uh, we always love hearing those, those, those stories. So, and really happy about uh, all that you're going to be able to do with this maintenance of effort budget. As you mentioned, the continued the opening of the East County Educational Campus. I know my colleague represents East County and all of us are very excited about that. Um, so just really, really happy to hear that. Um, we can go to the packet, and, unless any of my colleagues do you have anything to say at this point? Okay, so we'll dive in and uh, Ms. McGuire. Thank you. Uh, and we will, the packet does provide a, an overview and then as well dives into some of the um, revenue expenditures and staffing and other elements. So we'll walk through that and pause for questions as we go. Um, as has been mentioned, the college has put forward a maintenance of effort budget. And relative to the council president's guidance regarding the reconciliation list, which again, um, his guidance for this operating budget is that any funding above last year's funding um, for any department or agency would be placed on the reconciliation list for consideration. Um, we just would note that the maintenance of effort for the college is that the county provide the same level of funding as last year. So under this funding recommendation, there would not be um, a need for any of the funds for the college to go on the reconciliation list. Some of the increases in the funds that we'll talk about are not uh, in county dollars. So at least again at that level and as proposed, uh, just wanted to clarify that aspect of the process before we dive in. <clears throat> Pardon me. So the the. Um, the, also, just to reference that the county executive has also um, recommended full support of the college's budget as well. So there's no difference between uh, that recommendation and the college's recommendation. Beginning on page two and the top of page three of your packet, um, we have a detailed um, breakout of the funds that, the revenues rather, that support the current fund. And the college um, is comprised of many funds uh, that, that each have different purposes. The current fund is sort of the, the largest bucket of funding that, uh, again, supports most of the operations of the, of the uh, college and, um, and includes the county funding appropriation as well as tuition, state aid, um, and then some other revenues as well. <clears throat> that uh, breakdown is highlighted for you on the top of page three of your packet. As Dr. Williams mentioned, this uh, budget does assume the first tuition increase since FY20. Um, it is uh, a relatively uh, modest increase of uh, $2 for county residents per credit hour, $4 for state residents, and $6 for out-of-state residents. 
there is an increase in state funding. Um, and the one significant increase that we'll talk about a little bit more um, is that the college is using a significant amount of its accumulated fund balance to support key priorities, um, again, without having to ask for additional new county dollars. Um, similar to other conversations we've had, the, um, both related to the college and, and to other agencies, the college has for a number of years had an increasing fund balance, and this year um, is requesting to transfer a significant amount to support the East County uh, capital expenditures as well as support some key priorities in the operating budget. And so overall the current fund expenditures increase to support the East County Education Center, employee compensation, and then of course as everyone else um, the college is also experiencing contractual and operational inflationary expenses. Pause there. Uh, any comments from colleagues on that? I think we keep going. I, I did want to mention, I'm, I, I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, Ms. McGuire, just we, we are still in obviously the reconciliation process as far as that guidance that we're going to, everything above FY23 levels, but it's a good thing from Garment College that since you're not at that, you will be able to, one of the very few that don't have to go on that list, uh, assuming uh, our, our action today, so, uh, but with the other items, um, we're, we will be designating things as priority or high priority uh, for going forward. So just wanted to mention that, mm -hmm. but yeah, please continue. On the top of page four of your packet, another major area of effort for the college is the Workforce Development and Continuing Education Fund. Um, the college does also receive state aid for this fund. Uh, it is separate from the current fund, but again supports a large number of um, important credential and certification programs as, other, as well as other continuing education. The college received a significant increase of state aid for this fund in this year, which is um, good news as these are, um, again, really important, um, important offerings to have for students. Uh, just to touch briefly again on the fund balance uh, for the current fund, again the college has had an increasing fund balance for several years. This budget seeks to um, make very judicious and effective use of those dollars. Um, of they, the college is requesting to transfer $20.5 million of the fund balance, $10 million uh, to the Major Facilities Reserve Fund to support build out of the East County Education Center, and then the remainder for the current fund. Um, there is a table on the top of page five of your packet, um, and it does show that even with the significant drawdown of funds, the college will still have a very significant um, amount of funding as its fund balance. The college also does have a little different of a um, policy stance in the county's fiscal reserve policy regarding fund balance because the college uh, does have uh, some separate financial responsibilities. The college is required to have about a three to five percent reserve under that policy. Um, clearly this does exceed that, um, but again, so that, that difference above that percentage, then we sort of consider the unassigned fund balance. Um, again, this makes very reasonable, um, in council staff's view, this budget makes very reasonable use of these funds and will continue, of course, to have the conversation in future years about uh, how that fund balance can continue to be um, used to support priorities. Uh, anyone from the college want to add anything to that, or you agree? Go ahead, Mr. Colette. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, you, you take yes for an answer. Okay. Yeah. We we had a long discussion about fund balance yesterday, and uh, in MCPS context, obviously different from from your context, but it is something in a year where we're going to be looking for uh, you know savings and, and struggle to fund other things, where it's it's part of the conversation. But I think in the totality of your budget, in my view, the fact that it's a maintenance of effort, but you know, I think this is totally reasonable. So appreciate that. Please continue. Um, the next, we have an update on the college's COVID-19 relief funding. The college, of course, received um, significant funding from federal and state relief funding uh, as a result of um, efforts during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the acronym here is HERF. Uh, which is the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. Um, the, we, the college did receive three uh, allocations of that funding. There's specific detail summarized on the top of page six of your packet, as well as um, further detail uh, in the attachments to your packet. Um, the college, uh, the, the HERF funding really went to both institutional purposes and then also direct student aid, and the college did utilize 46% of their total award as emergency aid for students, uh, which 
which was the required amount. And then the summary that you have here again in your packet relates to the institutional purposes uh, to support the college um, in its recovery efforts as well. Um, the college has expended nearly all of its funds and those will come to a close shortly. Sounds good. Let's continue. Uh, the college also uh, has provided uh, information related to its racial equity and social justice efforts, again, uh, as is required by the Council's Racial Equity and Social Justice Act, uh, that all budget um, submissions be analyzed through the lens of racial equity. Um, there's some information just again summarizing some of that, uh, some of those statements on circles, pages six and seven of your packet. Montgomery County, sir, I'm sorry, Montgomery College serves all members of the community and over half of the college's enrollment is composed of black and Hispanic students and approximately 70% of the college's enrollment are students of color. This, the college has been identified as a minority serving institution as well as a Hispanic serving institution and an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. So clearly uh, very representative of the diversity in our community. Just want to pause there. I just, I, when I worked at the Department of Education, I worked a lot with these MSIs and HSIs and API institutions. It's just a, such a unique distinction that we are as an institution that is multiple of those at the same time. Usually that doesn't happen a lot. And um, I'm actually curious, maybe you guys can find out and let us know. I, I'm not, I, I, I would wager that it's a small group of institutions across the country that are in that category that are multiple um, so it might be a selling point you know for the, to, to for us but um, and we st and we also still have a significant uh, though it's not a um, you know we don't we haven't reached there on with our black population it's still a significant population so uh, just a testament to the work uh, that we're doing and I don't does this capture also how many of the students are from uh, this reach from Montgomery County. Do you know? Do you have that number? I know it's high, but I don't believe I have. I, we can definitely get you those numbers, yeah. Chairman Jawan. Yeah, I don't I think it's, it's in here. It's, it's extremely high, as you yeah. as you mentioned. I don't want to give inaccurate information, but we can definitely. Yeah, call I just think it's a, it's just the point being, you're you're a resource. You have a lot of MCPS students coming through. We represent the more than the, even more than the diversity of the community people are, are from here that live here and then they come back and work here i mean you guys are just really creating that pipeline so it's just this chart i think says it in a uh, in a big way so and the year over year the spring to spring that's i've, I've never heard that I, like i said you, that's the first time in over 10 years that you've seen an increase and normally the trend is when the economy goes down it go, the uh, enrollment goes up um but I think you guys have demonstrated that you're just moving forward either way. So, so we're excited about that. Ms. Uh, right, just would, just would add that um, the screen was reminding me that we're 90 percent uh, in county. That's what I thought. I knew it was something high. Thank you. So moving on to enrollment, um, Montgomery Co College is the largest community college in Maryland and it serves residents apparently 90% from the county, thank you, uh, as well as beyond and, um, and a very large percentage of uh, MCPS graduates who stay in state uh, do attend Montgomery College as part of their in-state journey. As we were discussing, the college, um, along with many other institutions, did experience a decline in enrollment during the pandemic. And actually, the college's um, enrollment had been declining, albeit less sharply, for many years prior to that. As you can see on page eight of your packet, however, uh, the college's enrollment is beginning to come back up, as Dr. Williams just indicated. Um, the increases are beginning to show both in terms of increases over projections and increases over last year's actuals. Um, so that's certainly very encouraging. And the projections that are shown in the graph on page eight are much more um, much more uh, upward trending than the projections that were shown at this time last year. So I think that the, the beginning of that actual experience is really, um, again, uh, hopefully the beginning of a very positive trend. The college does also continue to assess and innovate around its efforts at outreach and increasing enrollment generally. Um, a number of those efforts are outlined in the budget submission and, and one uh, of those efforts does include an additional position to really focus um, specifically on, in, on enrollment management and efforts. Um, there's also also similar enrollment projection trends related again to the non-credit uh, area of the workforce development and current, um, I'm sorry, continuing education enrollment as well. All right. I don't think any questions there. Please continue. 
Um, certainly, along with declines in enrollment has been a, a decline or an impact on tuition and fees for a number of years. Um, again, hopefully with the increased enrollment, that is the uh, tuition and fees is the second um, largest component of funding in the current fund. And so certainly its relationship to the county funding is an important one for us from a fiscal um, perspective. Um, certainly uh, encouraging that en enrollment is on its way up. And again, um, a very modest increase in tuition and fees for the first time since FY20. And so certainly maintaining low tuition is an important access point. Um, but as uh, Dr. Williams pointed out, this is well below uh, inflationary levels. $2 for in county, right? $4 for out of county, $6 for out of state. Yes. And, and still be, that would still be an in county student $5,394 a year, which is a 1.4% increase from last year. Obviously, well, well, well below inflation. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so okay. I think, and well worth it. So please continue. The college's FY24 operating budget adds one position. Uh, that position is actually not tax supported. It's in the auxiliary fund uh, and is intended to help uh, increase supervision over what is a, a large uh, number of efforts there. Uh, so the current fund uh, tax supported positions remain level from last year. Thank you. In terms of compensation and benefits, um, the co college's FY24 request includes $1.2 in increased compensation and benefit costs. Um, and the information that's summarized in your packet and that Dr. Williams referenced also is from the GEO committee discussion of pay increases from the other day. Um, the college uh, has provided information on the uh, negotiated salary increases that they have uh, reached with their employee associations. Thank you, and we, we asked MCPS to do the same. So again, you're leading the way. <laughs> Uh, moving into some of the programmatic, oh, I'm sorry, was there another comment? No, there? Okay. please continue. Moving into some of the programmatic service changes, uh, again, the Montgomery College's total requested fund budget, current fund budget of $280 million request, reflects an increase of $5.7 million or 2% from FY23. As we discussed, there are no positions included in that. Um, the breakdown is highlighted on page 10 of your packet, $1.1 million for pay adjustments and wage increases, 4.6 million related to higher costs and inflation, and 90,000 for additional scholarship funds. The funds for the education, East County Education Center, um, of what we've reproduced here in the packet are the some of the additional operating funds were actually added last year, and of course are carried through because there was um, the need to begin implementing that. The significant um, increase of fund balance to support the build out actually appears in the um, major facilities reserve fund as that fund balance. Um, the college may want to provide some more update uh, information. There's information in your packet, but also just to discuss the timeline and overall progress for opening that center. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. We'd love to hear that, and I'm, I'm sure there's questions from colleagues. So, yeah, could you give us an update on, on where things are with the East County Educational Center? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Jawando. So right now we are on target for fall of 23, and I'm, we're encouraging everyone to think about fall of 23. It's probably the, the middle of fall of 23, um, and that's, you know, if supply chain issues don't, you know, kind of do what they sometimes do. Um, but. The great thing, one of the great things about East County Education Center and Montgomery College in general is that it's, you know, we have credit and non-credit opportunities. We have flexible scheduling. You know, we have 15-week um, courses and seven-week courses. So fall of 23 means that we can still, and we are still planning to offer educational opportunities in East County Education Center. So we are on target for that. And as I shared, that would be classrooms and labs once that's fully outfitted, really looking at Right now, some of the primary opportunities that we have are uh, early childhood education, um, healthcare components, obviously um, cybersecurity and overall IT, business entrepreneurship, and then we're also, and I know Council Member Mink and other Council Members have a deep interest as we um, engage the eastern part of the county to find out what some of the needs are and as we talk about economic development and look towards building out the ECEC and the actual campus, are there opportunities 
to be in a conversation where it would be great if individuals or organizations, businesses come to the eastern part of our county because we can create the actual workforce that they need. I mean, we're literally building this. So I think this is a huge um, driver and a really enticing opportunity for organizations, industries that may want to locate to East County. And I'll share with them, Mr. Collette, if there's probably a little more detail he can offer. So I would just add that we're clearly knee deep into the work around hiring general contractors, um, looking at building systems, uh, scheduling those uh, fit outs. We've worked uh, across all the programmatic areas to ensure that their needs have been identified and that we have a schedule uh, to get that work. As Dr. Williams uh, indicated, we're going to be at the mercy to some extent around what the market conditions are, but we've clearly spent a significant amount of time ensuring that we've got A, a good plan, one to deliver that uh, and budget, uh, all of the uh, building f furnishings and how it's integrated into the rest of the college community are all, are all important considerations uh, as, as part of that work. And then I would just say lastly that um, in addition uh, to the work around delivering the, the center, as Dr. Williams noted, uh, there's work uh, underway around the, the campus and a part of that involves uh, facilities master planning work um, and as we engage each of the surrounding communities of our existing campuses, we also plan to engage the East County community in their support and envisioning what that looks like. And so we will know that we'll, come, we'll engage, I mean, that'll actually be, you know, storyboarding and visioning sessions that we would anticipate somewhere between the latter portion of May and prior to the end of the uh, county's public school systems academic year, June 16th, so in that time, time frame. So we'll be sure to keep you posted about that and the opportunities to engage and participate. Appreciate that, and I, I just want to give a shout out to Jay Rubanda, who's here, our East County Region, who who I know will let you know and is working with you on what the community needs uh, as far as the uh, programming. Um, and I'll turn to colleagues, but just one quick question for me: Could you just talk about the if you're a student in East County and you're you're waiting for this and you're excited, when can you start? When will you be at the point where something will turn on for you to register? And what is the capacity? Do you think of the education center this fall. You know, do you have a sense of that? So, um, if we go backwards, so it's a fifty-five thousand square foot building. Um, uh, we we are fitting it out with a number of labs around the nursing program to support cybersecurity um, because the because it will be easier to lead first with the non-credit offerings, uh, given the scheduling of the academic terms. Um, we're hopeful that uh, to the, the middle to the latter portion of the fall to be able to uh, have some level of engagement around the academic programming at the at the center. Um, we'll certainly, uh, as we get closer to the fall and know that there aren't any construction <laughs> delays because we wouldn't want to overpromise and then sure. go, oops, yeah. um, we'll be sure to advertise uh, advertise the enrollments. I think among the plans for the, the facility uh, is that we want to offer really an integrated approach to simplify the access, right, so that um, residents across the county and certainly in the East County are able to enroll more easily, um, get their appropriate supports that they need to, to get. And, and if we look at the range of programming and services that are offered, whether we're engaging with, say, WorkSource Montgomery or others, you know, there'll be services there that, uh, that will begin. What they are exactly at this point, uh, we'll just have to stay tuned a little bit so sure. that we can be sure that based on the fit out of the facility, we we can we can offer that. Certainly, we know um, without fail, uh, January will be full service. Uh, is the plan? Before then, we're a little bit at the whim of the construction schedule. Okay. And when full service is there, what's the capacity? How many students do you roughly do, would be able to be? So we'll be kind of at a we have a sense of that. Our, our goal is that we have flexible scheduling, and so um, workforce development lends itself to a different time frame. Sure. Yeah. So we're hoping it, uh, one of those labs will be a flexible lab, um, such that if you're doing HVAC on a Monday, you can do plumbing on a Tuesday. Um, so we're trying to be creative that way as well to get the best use of it. And so uh, we're, we're still, you know, fleshing out hours and, and hours of operation. And so it's very difficult for yeah. us right now to, yeah. you know, put that on a piece of paper and say how many students within a, a, a sure. flow. Um, because as mentioned, uh, this is our first combined 
location at, to this extent where programming will serve uh, the different routes, whether you're going for a degree or whether you're going for yeah. more of a certificate or a short-term completion. Um, so uh, a lot of newness sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of working through, you know, throughout all of the divisions of the college to accomplish this. So, you know, we are still uh, working through that math right now. Understood. Yeah, and I and just, uh, I just underscore what you said. The just as important as it opening, or maybe even more important, is that people know it know it's open, and that so the the robust plan. I'd love to come back in the summer uh, and get an update as you get closer and know more on construction, and be partners with you in trying to get that word out. Obviously, with the East County team, because uh, I think that's going to be really important to the success of it. Just people knowing and having a robust plan there, which I know you will, so that's awesome. And no, we, we certainly share that and we'll be happy to come back to update and note too that part of the facility planning allows for space for community use, right, because we really want this to be community accessible. So even when some of the educational spaces are not available, um, there is a significant programmed area for community use and as Ms. Greeny noted, looking very flexibly about scheduling so that we're really optimizing and being responsive to the demand side of, of the needs as well. Okay. Councilmember May? I mean, I love this conversation. <laughs> Obviously, I think everybody knows what a big fan I am of Montgomery College. Uh, as a former Montgomery College student myself, <clears throat> as well as a former MCPS teacher, uh, and I'm just so excited to, to see it coming to East County. Montgomery College, of course, is such an essential part of, I think, where this county is going in terms of academic pathway and workforce development and economic development. Um, we'll be talking to, to USG soon. We'll be talking about the Ready Institute. Um, all of these pieces are just such an opportunity to really bring together and, and consolidate these pathways and ensure that we have everything in-house right here to provide an excellent uh, and very you know path menu of pathways to our to our Montgomery County young people and ensure that they end up with uh, you know with a, with a career that they're excited about and that can pay their bills and that allows them to stay here in Montgomery County um, with their family and their community uh, you know and and contribute to our ecosystem as as adults and so uh, this whole this whole conversation that we're having from you know MCPS to MC uh, to USG, the ready. It's, I mean, all of these pieces are just so essential, uh, and I really appreciate that that I sit with colleagues who I know are, are just as excited about it as I am. Um, and also, you know, I want to mention that Montgomery College's holistic approach to what it means to be, uh, you know, an academic institute that it's not just about you know, the classes and the degrees that you really have to uh, build a community and take care of your students in all of these different ways, connecting to resources, providing resources, um, engaging and building those connections so that you can problem solve. All of those pieces, uh, you know, are part of what make Montgomery College work. Uh, and make it so successful, and we're seeing that reflected, you know, in your enrollment numbers, uh, you know, and all of your other um, different metrics. So, so it's working, uh, and I'm and I'm so excited to see that piece come to East County, uh, an area where it is just ripe for opportunity. Uh, you know, the community has been calling out for this kind of opportunity. Uh, the, the, the landscape there is such that, you know, there are so many opportunities for businesses to come in. People are waiting to spend their money there um, and, uh, and stop driving to other places. We just have a wealth of diverse talent amongst our, our students and our community. So all of the pieces are coming together. I, I'm, just, I'm just thrilled to see it all unfold. Um, I love how important community engagement is uh, to you as from during my campaign to uh, right up through now, I'm still hearing from residents uh, who are really excited about what's coming to East County uh, and want to be part of that conversation of what opportunities are going to be there. Uh, and I know that that's how you want to drive the ship also. So uh, to be able to plug all those pieces together, including working with the businesses about what's going to get them excited, uh, it just all makes a lot of sense. And, and um, as uh, Chair Jawando mentioned, I, we all are, are really excited to work and partner with you to do whatever we can to help get the word out uh, from all of the different uh, you know, forums and meets and so on that I know you'll, you're going to be starting to hold this spring and summer, uh, and, then, and then moving forward as well as things start to open up in the 
mid to late fall, hopefully. <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, looking forward to making sure that you have what you need for East County and the CIP when we start looking you know, next year and, and moving on forward. So thank you all uh, so much for being here and for, for what you're doing for the community. And, uh, and I'm going to turn it back to, to the chair. Thank you. Councilor Alvaro. Thank you. So, well, first, Dr. Williams, welcome. Thank you again for your tremendous leadership. Thank you to your incredible team. And thank you also for, once again, as Chair Jawando mentioned, being such a great partner. Um, we really appreciate and, and acknowledge and take into account in future fiscal years when you guys are uh, hold back uh, in, in making your requests. We don't forget those things. Uh, so we, we really do appreciate it. So a couple of thoughts. Um, the return on investment in Montgomery College continues to grow. Um, it's extraordinary. I, I have a high school student now. We're starting to look at colleges, and it's like totally overwhelming. Um, and so I do think that um, the more we can promote and uplift what we see in this packet, uh, and just to tell that story of that return on investment to our students and let our families know there is another incredible option um, that my family has taken advantage of. As I've said many times, my parents met as students at Montgomery College. Um, and if I had to do it all over again, I transferred my sophomore year. I've never said this publicly before. I should have gone to Montgomery College when I graduated from high school. Um, but I just really uh, tremendously appreciate your leadership. And with regards to East County, yes, it's one of the most exciting things that projects I've seen since, you know, in, in our first term. And during the, uh, the ribbon cutting, uh, the only person who was more excited than Jeru and all of us was the general manager at the Five Guys, uh, who's very excited uh, once, once things are up and running. Uh, a lot of the students are going to be going over there, I'm sure, and taking advantage of that great shopping center. Um, but I did want to ask, so have we done an assessment, and Jeru, you're probably in a better position to answer this, on evaluating sort of the transportation lines, the ride-on lines? Because as we ramp up, if we need to make adjustments and tweaks, I know that's a separate committee, um, but we will want to do that so that as many students as possible can get to and from classes. I don't know if we've done an evaluation or worked with DOT on that. So we have in the location, and Drew, please feel free, but the location is how many feet away from a, a stop? It's uh, right in front of. The yeah, and so, so we, we do have transportation access there. That was one of the components that was taken into very serious consideration in regards to leasing, leasing a space. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know if I add any more, Jeru. Mm -hmm. Yes, good morning. Jeru Bandia, Director of the East County Regional Office. Yes, uh, there is currently a bus line that actually circulates uh, from in the Fairland area uh, connecting the hospital through Broadbridge, right in front of the uh, proposed location for the education center and uh, back to the parking along to connect with the uh, US-29 BRT system. As we get closer to opening, uh, a request will be made to the Department of Recreation, I'm sorry, Department of Transportation to reassess that route, and if there's need to be any adjustments, I'm definitely sure the county executive uh, and uh, the DOT will, will support it. Great. And inside of that, you know, the the college does operate a shuttle shuttle service, uh, and as part of our calculus, we're going to be looking as well to see what are the student patterns that we need to be supporting and serving as well to augment public transportation. Terrific. Great progress. Thank you. Great questions and great points. We're all excited, so we can't wait. Um, Ms. McGuire, let's continue. <clears throat> so moving on briefly to a summary of some of the non-tax supported funds, again that does conclude our discussion of the current fund. Um, the, these are just itemized for you in your packet on pages 11 and 12. Um, uh, again in the workforce development and continuing education, the significant increase there is from state aid, which we appreciate certainly. Um, in cable TV, the college is recommending to use some of its fund balance to increase its efforts there above uh, what comes through the county cable plan. Again, the auxiliary, auxiliary enterprises uh, did have one position added there. Uh, the transportation fund is the same level as last year, uh, as are the um, county contribution to the, to the grants. And then the major facilities reserve fund we have discussed, in addition to the East County Center, funds in here uh, support the cost of the Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation Arts Center and also uh, intended to uh, do some ball field work uh, in Germantown. Sounds good. 
So that concludes the review. Uh, the, again, council staff's uh, recommendation is certainly to support uh, all aspects of the college's FY24 operating budget request as put forward. They have requested, as we've said, the minimum amount from the county and have made very effective use of other resources to support key priorities. Thank you. And I, I think uh, I can venture to say without objection, we will accept that recommendation and, and you will not be on the rec reconciliation list, sir. So. Congratulations and uh, thank you to the entire team. So, thank you, Dr. Williams and team. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Jawando. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Have a great day. You too. And then we'll transition to our second item, uh, which is the Universities of Shady Grove. Um, so, whoever's here, I see Mary Lang and. Uh, come on down. Julie Knight, I'm sorry, I should have acknowledged you earlier. It's good to see you from OMB. She's, she'll be with us for a little while here. Uh, chime, if you want to wave at me, if you want to say anything. Okay. Um, good to see you, Mary. I know uh, Dr. Kadimian couldn't be here, but uh, I spoke to her earlier, this, you know, or both of you earlier this week, and uh, we continue to be excited about the, the work that USG does and the pipeline uh, that you are part of um, in our educational and workforce development ecosystem. Um, and so we'll uh, also appreciate that your budget request is a flat request this year. You know, you're helping us out. And uh, so the same for 475,000 uh, to support the Ready Institute, which I want to get, let, give you the opportunity to, to, to talk about and bring up any points and then we'll turn to staff and colleagues. So, Ms. Lang. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, first of all, I want to start by just saying thank you. Um, what's really interesting about this opportunity that happened last fiscal year uh, was the continued deep collaboration between the Universities of Shady Grove and the county. Uh, as a reminder, Shady Grove's most of its budget comes from the state um, as a state entity and part of the University System of Maryland. This uh, first funding opportunity to work directly with the county in creating career ready pathways was significant and innovative in and of itself. I wanted to thank you for that opportunity and secondly uh, remind you what the Ready Institute stands for. It stands for Re um, Resilient Education for All Designed for You. And the reason that we chose Ready Institute was to design career ready pathways, not individual programs for students, but actually pathways. And I will give you an example of one of the first key indicators that Ready Institute can perform is taking workforce development projections that many of you have seen from MCEDC, from workforce investment boards, through REACH institutes, what are the needs of the workforce, and yet we have not had the opportunity to marry those with the current opportunities of programs. We have spent this past year doing some of that work at the system level and also at the Shady Grove level, level to begin to understand what needs are in the workforce and what the programs are graduating to meet those needs. Um, and that uh, marrying has gone along standard industrial classification codes and I'm proud to say that the University System of Maryland has put all of their programs into um, these SIC codes and we have put our programs at Shady Grove into those as well. So we're beginning at from our level going backwards into MC and MCPS by beginning this process of putting those pieces together. Secondly, um, our work this year has been standing up the Institute and um, I'll let Essie talk about what we're doing, but I just wanted to set the frame of what the need is for Ready Institute. It continues to be a gap in terms of having some data analytics that all three of our institutions can work for and towards in readying the pathways for the workforce and embedding on top of that the career readiness competencies that we all believe are important to add to academic content of Pathways. That's a lot, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to set the stage of how important the need is for Ready at this time. 
Appreciate that, uh, Ms. Lang. And, you know, we're excited. I know I was, we were excited uh, when we, just, we put the money in for this initiative. Obviously, uh, eager to see it really get going. <laughs> Um, and uh, look forward to having you know updates later in the year as you as you move along the on the process. Um, I'll turn to Ms. McGuire just to give us an overview, and then your colleagues have anything to say after that. Any questions? And thank you. And just a, a couple of comments, as as Ms. Lang discussed, this really grew out of a number of conversations that um, the previous Education and Culture Committee and and the previous uh, Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee had had around workforce development and really asking all of the partners, the educational partners as well as the workforce partners, to develop a holistic approach of how to um, begin to pull these pieces together. The Ready Institute proposal was one aspect of that. And so um, among the things that this committee, I'm sure, uh, together with most likely the Economic Development Committee will want to come back to is that larger discussion and situate that uh, this within that. Of course, what's before you right now is specific to the Ready Institute itself. Um, the executive's recommendation is to continue the funding that was provided last year of 475000 Again, since that's level funding without an increase, it does not technically need to be in the reconciliation list process as we've discussed. Um, and as Ms. Lang uh, mentioned, uh, with an effort of this nature, there's a lot of initial uh, planning and uh, coordination that needs to be done. USG uh, did provide um, the expenditure uh, information for the FY23 funding. Uh, they project that about 225,000 of the 475,000 will be spent in this coming fiscal, in, I'm sorry, in the current fiscal year between now and the end of the fiscal year. Of course, unspent funds will fall to the general fund, which is fine. Um, and then the question I think uh, really is of the planning and uh, stand-up efforts that are continuing. Um, will council staff just ask the question of whether the full 475000 might be needed next year or because the budget that's in your packet for those funds does seem to indicate full year efforts for all of those pieces. Um, and so just wanted to again throw that out there for possible discussion. Um, uh, that's the, again, one question for discussion. There are detailed um, aspects of the budget proposal in your packet. Um, USG has hired one position to date. Uh, of course, there are plans to bring on additional staff as well. And again, a lot of the initial work is, um, as Ms. Lang was describing, around bringing together the data infrastructure and system infrastructure pieces that need to come together to inform the effort. Appreciate that. Um, and Ms. Lang, do you have any comment on that? Uh, you know, obviously, we, I want this. We'll come back with the Economic Development Committee post budget and get a you know a real in depth Correct. update on your work with Aces and the college and the collaboration that's happening on this pipeline effort. I, I think it's important enough to our overall uh, economic development in the county and our efforts to you know I would just personally think we just leave it in there. But I want to know you know what do you project into next year? That you would need, would you utilize the full 475 in, in the next fiscal year, or um, if you give some insight on that, since it was raised, I think we should discuss it. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we believe that if we have the ability to start using the funds, and we have some infrastructure in place now to accommodate using the funds, we believe that we could use the 475. Um, and the reason being that we have not spent any funds this year in the planning year um, for data infrastructure and networking and so hardware and software that may we need to be um, used to bring all the pieces of the data together. Uh, it could be significant. It could be up to $150,000, $200,000 that we're hoping to procure probably by the end of FY24, and then secondly, put in place not only our current staff, which is a senior data scientist, but bring on board a full-time Ready Institute director. Um, we hope that will occur before the end of FY24, and hopefully that person could begin um, um, in the spring, but we're, we're not sure how and what that person would look like. But that's a very significant and important position to really drive the work of the Ready Institute. So those are two components that we think are m markedly different than the infrastructure pieces and coordination that we've worked with in the um, so far 
far to date, uh, but, but probably may need by the end of FY24. Okay. I appreciate that, and thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Councilor Albert, I have a question. Uh, thanks. So I had the opportunity to meet with the um, universities of Shady Grove teams just a couple days ago, and I really appreciate Ms. McGuire trying to find every penny uh, in this budget and certainly understand and respect that. We're, dry, we're trying to do that in every way we can, always do, but especially this year. Um, I concur with uh, Chair Jawando's uh, feeling at this time. We've got to set this up with fidelity and make sure that it gets really hits the ground running because it, there's a lot we will be able to build off of and leverage once it's fully established. Um, but we do need to check in, and so. But do you anticipate any challenges bringing on contractors or hiring? It's a tough market right now, or do you anticipate that still going fairly smoothly? Excuse me. That frankly was um, one of the issues because you need a high-level senior data scientist, a data engineer, and data analyst. Um, we did run into some delays in finding um, those that would be have the expertise to bring on board. We were lucky to find some consultants that we have a relationship with that um, will help set us the, up with an infrastructure and begin to do the recruiting for a senior level project manager and then also data, um, excuse me, uh, institute director. So um, to that end, yes, it, there could be challenges about finding the significant data resources uh, needed. However, um, I believe that now we have a base group that is focused on the technology and the IT components that will remain in place and, um, and so we can work from there as a good base. Uh, other challenges can um, continue in the sense of it is a lot of multiple stakeholders to bring together. We have great collaboration with Montgomery College and MCPS and also with our system institutions. We now um, also have collaboration efforts underway with MCEDC and WorkSource Montgomery that are just beginning. So connecting those dots, bringing the stakeholders together um, just takes time to get everybody in the room and on the same page, but, um, but we've made great strides in that work. That would be another challenge. And then finally, um, a challenge around um, spending the effort to share data. That is some of the infrastructure work we've done this this year as well. As you can imagine, um, between institutions, there is a need to be clear about what data elements can and should be shared for this type of work so that we're not infringing on students' confidentiality or the institution's confidentiality agreement. So we have and will continue to create um, data sharing agreements with those groups, and that is taking a, perhaps longer than we thought. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thank you for that for that background, and thank you for those great questions. That's that's helpful. Um, yeah, I, I concur uh, with my colleagues that I think that the you know the ROI on this is is so great that we want to we want to give you the tools to hire for those positions and, and do what you need to do uh, in the hopes that, that you're able to do that. And it sounds like um, you're working hard to to try and make that possible. Uh, so this is, this is an exciting project uh, and really what is needed to get the, the mechanism that we've been talking about going. Uh, so I appreciate my predecessors also for, for helping to, to get these pieces in place. Uh, and then I also just wanted to mention, um, Councilmember Albernos was, was talking about how we need to check in, uh, completely agree. Uh, and as we're, you know, once the Ready Institute is fully operational, we had talked about, you know, the possibility of uh, some kind of accountability summit uh, annually, and I just wanted to note that for the record. I think it's a great idea. I think that uh, there's tremendous benefit in that kind of transparency for the public. Um, and, uh, and it's because I feel confident that you know you're going to be doing great work, and we want to make sure that everybody knows about it, uh, and that you know that would also be a, a tool for helping to make sure that our students, uh, you know, are aware of these pathways and of the um, levels of, of success uh, that these pathways can, can help them achieve. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we got that into the record uh, as something to think about moving forward, and as you all are thinking about plans. Thank you. Um, that is a great uh, reminder to include that um, because I do think the the 
benefit of having that accountability summit is to bring all the stakeholders together, as I mentioned, and in, a, in an ability to have clear goals amongst each other. So we're all um, speaking not only from the same page, which many of us do, but we're all aimed in large goals together to have them be accomplished. So I, I thank you for reminding us to include that as part of our work. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a really good point. We like accountability. So. Um, Yes, I'd just like to add that um, I do um, like your suggestion and really encourage you to bring us back um, to talk about the work um, in general along with the larger concept about an educational ecosystem and Ready Institute and its components as we came before the other um, two committees last year. So we look forward to that discussion. Absolutely, we'll do it. And we'll, we'll make sure Montgomery College and MCPS has representation mm -hmm. too uh, and WorkSource Montgomery. So. Um, Wonderful. Uh, so I think without objection, we'll accept the county executive's recommendation of level funding of 475000 All right. Thank you very much. All right. We'll move to um, item three, uh, Montgomery County Public Libraries, and ask uh, Ms. Vassallo and Mr. Donaldson, Ms. Brown, Ms. Hawes, Mr. Capini, uh, Dr. Whedon, and Deborah Lambert from OMB to come on down. And I think this is Dr. Wheaton's first. Is this your first time before us? Yes. Yeah, we've heard a lot about you, so we're <laughs> glad you're here. The, we love everybody else too, but you know, but we, these vacancies is something we were considering. Okay. Oh, wonderful, okay. And I'm going to happily turn this over to my colleague lead for libraries uh, uh, Kristen Mink, uh, Councilmember Kristen Mink to lead this discussion. Thank you chair and thank you all for being here today. Um, I was not able to be here last time we had the libraries before us. I was out sick and, uh, and appreciate um, my colleagues for, for making it all happen um, but I'm very glad to be here with you all today. Um, so Welcome to, uh, to all of you. Welcome to Ms. Vassallo. Um, we know obviously that our libraries have been really stretched over the last few years. Uh, you have been carrying greatly increased burdens uh, for us uh, and also opening up you know, our eyes to, the pos to you know, greater possibilities of what our libraries can do and really demonstrating what essential hubs they are for our communities. Um, that uh, as much as I love books and literacy, I'm a former English teacher myself, um, libraries are that and so much more, you know, helping us to achieve, uh, you know, HHS goals, academic goals, all of these, all of these different pieces. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're being really thoughtful and, and funding accordingly to make all of those pieces possible. Uh, you know, we've always had vacancies, but uh, we have been asking staff to do a lot more with less in many cases moving forward. So we know that our libraries are extremely well run. Um, we have been investing heavily on the CIP side. We've been seeing those those buildings uh, going going up and seeing improvements. It's very exciting. Uh, I was just at the ribbon cutting of Potomac, which was great. Um, and now we have decisions before us about how to invest on the uh, operating side. Uh, and making sure that we are able to recruit and retain as necessary. So thank you for being here for this important conversation. Um, I wanted to turn it, uh, Anita, to, to you for comments, and then we'll go to, yeah, to staff. So good morning, uh, Council Members Mink, Jawando, and Albernaz. We're very happy to be here before you. I think of the three of you as great library supporters and friends of libraries, so wonderful for you to be composing the committee. I'd like to introduce my staff that's with me uh, today. So down at the end, we have uh, Mr. Steve Capani, who is the business manager for the library system, uh, Felicity Brown, who is the manager of the collection management unit of the library system, so is responsible for materials and resource purchases, um, Dr. Luluita Whedon, who is our HR manager for just uh, not very much longer because she has been uh, named the deputy director of Montgomery County OHR. So. She will do a great job. Uh, the Assistant Director for Technology and Collection, James Donaldson, and, you know, Deborah and Carolyn and me. So, um, 
as we move into the next fiscal year and we look at our operating budget and you all have the information there you can see that the libraries um, have made a very concerted effort over the past year to ramp up our hiring to get um, uh, qualified competent uh, staff into all of our branches to serve our community in the way that they should be served um, coming out of the pandemic we were uh, down quite a few positions we've rebuilt and in order to continue rebuilding um, the county executive has recommended that uh, an $825,000 kind of increase to our budget actually it's a reduce in our lapse target so that we will have those funds to hire more staff for the libraries I know that all of you um, have looked at our strategic plan which we launched uh, last year uh, we have four goals that we feel are very important um, and as you mentioned, Council Member Mink, show the, um, the work that the library can do for the community. It's not just books um, any longer. There's a lot more to it there. Um, one of those goals that I would really like to point out is important <clears throat> is service to teens. Um, we all know that uh, teens and youth in our county are struggling um, with mental health issues, with substance abuse issues. Um, there was a young man who apparently overdosed on marijuana at Rockville just yesterday it was his second time doing this at that library um, so we have hired our teen program manager um, he is working very aggressively to um, provide services for teens at each of our libraries we're hiring in that area um, so as you look through the budget and you see the um, CE's recommendations for us I hope that you understand the importance of those to the community as well as to the library system the other requested enhancement of course is for a hundred thousand dollars to apply to our world language collection specifically in Spanish and Chinese um, uh, Ms. Brown knows more about where the items will be placed and how much a hundred thousand dollars would do for us but again that's our strategic goal number three so that speakers of other language can participate fully in the society around them um, being able to provide materials in their first language will definitely be a benefit to them um, I think that we have um, embarked upon work during fiscal year 23 that is going to positively affect the community um, we have hopes for much more in upcoming fiscal years uh, there are other things that we want to be able to do as we move forward perhaps with grant money from the state in terms of marketing getting our message out across the county um, but there are just a lot of really good things going on and we want to be able to continue that work even though I understand that there are budgetary constraints facing us um, in the upcoming years so we are here to answer any questions that you may have about the packet that are hiring our vacancy rates the use of our collections uh, or anything else okay. thank you mm -hmm. excellent points uh, unless my colleagues want to say anything we'll move to Ms. Chen all right you want to lead us through the packet hi this is Carolyn Chen legislative analyst with the Montgomery County Council um, today we are reviewing the fiscal year 24 recommended operating budget uh, for the public library system um, I have to say this is a very well run department and everyone on this committee and the staff have been very briefed <laughs> so I do want to just highlight a little bit and because we have everyone here that to answer your questions but just to highlight a couple of things um, first on page two the chart to the right uh, that was the vacancy update given to all central staff of the council on March 3rd you have in front of you a more totally recent April 17th update that we will discuss I just want to mention that um, in addition on page five is a summary of the public testimony on the council's operating budget public hearing uh, libraries always comes out in full force uh, additionally in the last two sections a1 
2A11 are the two hiring update presentations provided by the library system in October and in February. So you have a full picture of the last 12 months since the last budget. Um, and finally, I want to give a shout out to the innovation team, Kate who worked with the library system on the strategic plan. Um, with that, I would like to defer to the experts on questions. Thank you very much, and for this wonderful packet. Uh, it's very thorough, much appreciated. Um, yeah, I did want to note, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions, um, that there, I know there's a, uh, well, we have to choose priority or high priority, right, for, for each of everything that goes on the reconciliation list. Um, I know we can't make everything high priority. I acknowledge that. Um, I do want to note, though, that as we're looking at the lapse calculation um, and adding funding that uh, is going to really directly impact staffing, um, to me, that should be high priority. I know it's suggested here as priority. To me, I would bump that up to, to high priority because if you don't have all the staffing you need, uh, nothing else works. And, um, and we know that we are in dire straits. We have our, our librarians and the full staff are really trying hard, um, but they need us to step, up, to, to step up and help. If you wanted to, to speak to that. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, council member. We would like to see the priorities flipped um, with the staffing, obviously the high priority. The additional money for the World Language Collection, while very important to us, would be a lesser priority than the ability to hire in people, so. Thank you for that feedback. Questions from colleagues? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, you know, you know, as the former League for Libraries, and the, I, we, this staffing issue is something we've come back to time and time again, and, and the gap has closed greatly. I, I would like to allow uh, uh, Dr. Whedon to, if or whoever would like to, but I'm assuming it'd be you, to talk about the progress you've made over the last year in vacancies, because it's a, it's a governmental-wide issue it's a nationwide issue I think this is a silver lining of that issue I think you know libraries stand out uh, as small but mighty example of making progress on that um, and to Councilmember Mink's point have literally you know they were doing this before the pandemic but the function and form in re the communities relying on libraries has not gone down it's grown um, and you know I I often remark you know I said it uh, last year you know, I was in the grocery store and someone's, you know, was talking about COVID tests and where to get them and the, the, the score was out, you know, and this is when you couldn't find them. And the guy next to me, and I didn't say anything, you know, I just wearing my normal clothes and just no one knew who I was. And the guy next to him said, well, you just go to the library. They have them. You can pick them up there. And it was just like a cat. It was like a little fly on the wall. And it just made me so proud that it's just a small example of the, the work that you all have done and the community expectation that it will continue. Um, and staffing is, is obviously critical to that. I've also heard from many of your employees that have had issues, you know, are worried about being able to meet the needs of the community and the, the hours that they're working and, and being there. So uh, I would just like to allow you to talk, give an update and provide some context to this chart about where we've been and where we are on staffing. Uh, good morning, council members. Uh, thank you for affording me this opportunity to speak uh, in reference to MCPL's vacancies. So as you know, starting at the beginning of fiscal year 23, we had um, 104 vacancies overall. Um, as of today, we currently have 64 vacancies. However, out of those 64, we have 19 that will be filled before 5 June. They already have uh, orientation dates with the county. Um, in addition to that, I just want to back it up a little. Um, in total, if we are talking about from the beginning of the fiscal year till now, uh, MCPL had over 103 personnel that came on board to fill our vacant positions, new and internal. So as far as new faces that we've had to Montgomery County, we had a total of 56 personnel. And that's running, ranging from our highest um, manager positions all the way down to our library aides. As it concerns our internal fills, we filled over 47 voluntary transfer opportunities. And this is the opportunities that our personnel within MCPL has for uh, transfer opportunities within different branches. So we've had 47 actions and moves on that particular uh, uh, announcement. 
Um, as far as separations, we've only had 22 separations throughout the wow. fiscal year 23. We have one more uh, retirement as of this year. So out of those 22 departures, we've had 22 retirements, eight resignations, and just two terminations. So um, if we're talking about currently today, as I mentioned, we do have 64 uh, vacancies. 55 we're actually working on right now. I did project on the spreadsheet that you do have as to when I believe they will be filled. We have a few that will roll over into fiscal uh, FY24. Uh, for the operating, we did take into account our lapse target for FY23 prior to getting our budget approved for FY24. Um, and then out of those 64 positions, we do have nine that are pending reclass and or reannouncement. Uh, we wanted to make sure we just had that uh, buffer room to make sure we didn't exceed our lapse target. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, and then I, and on the slide, you do see, you'll see the in-depth uh, information for our uh, uh, current vacant announcements of where they're currently at today. So pending Appreciate any that. additional questions. Well, and I think I heard so of the 64 vacancies, 19 are in those, st our offers have been extended, people are starting. Yes, sir. So that's really more like 45 Correct. vacancies. Yes, council member. Down from 103, or is that? The, 104. 104 <laughs> at the beginning of the fiscal year. Yes. So it's almost 60%. Uh, you know, if I'm doing loose math here, I'm a lawyer, but <laughs> more than half, you cut, you cut it more when more than half in a fiscal year. I just think that that, uh, that doesn't happen often. And um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And combined with the low level of um, terminations and, and other reclassifications, I think that's good progress. And obviously we want you to keep keep moving and, and uh, filling those. And again, because I just, I've seen it, I know it. These, these positions are, are crucial. Uh, Ms. Vasallo mentioned the teen programs, the outreach work. Uh, we need more of that, not less, um, and uh, the, the people are the ones that are delivering that service. Uh, so really appreciate it, and in addition to the great refreshed buildings, you know. So um, I really appreciate it. That was the, the crux of my question, and turn it back to our, our lead. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Albernos in just a second. I just wanted a quick follow-up question on that. Um, Incredible work. That's fantastic. Um, wanted to see if you had had to, it, throughout this, the hiring process, if you had had to change standards or make any kind of tweaks like that in order to fill those positions. Um, yes, council member. Uh, so the main thing that we had to do is the first thing is I did establish a relationship with OHR. We meet still once a week every uh, morning just to go over our current priorities because anything can change within that week. In addition to that, I put timelines internally to MCPL. So once we received the eligible list, there was a timeline from the time we received it till the time we actually started interview. So then from that point, the additional timeline came on. So once the interview was completed, they had a certain timeline to get the reference checks completed. And then my part to do the wage equity to submit back to OHR. So in a timeline from the time we received the eligible list and from the time we extend the offer, we uh, decreased that from I think was before six months to three weeks. Wow. That's a big, that will do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, turn, let's turn it over to Councilmember Albernos. Thanks. Uh, pre appreciate And of course, I'm a big fan. <laughs> so uh, as all of us are, and Potomac was great. That was just another example of progress moving forward in so many different ways. Um, although I have, do have two overdue books that I have to get back to you guys this week. So um, I, I will work on that, I promise. Um, so just a clarification here. These are not new FTEs. What, that's, what, what we're talking about is adjusting the laps down um, by 825 because of the great progress that libraries has made in hiring the vacant positions. That's the justification. So I just want to make sure I got that. So I get that, um, and, and I very much respect and appreciate that. Um, LAPS has actually been gone up in the Department of Health and Human Services, um, and it's been gone from three months to six months because they are really struggling to hire social workers, nurses, and all those folks on the front lines. And so there's been an additional, as proposed by the county executive, over 1.5 in savings um, because it's just frankly taking so long. Um, so I, 
and, and it's great that we're making this progress because we talk a little bit operationally where where are these positions going um, and where are you know where, where are the needs being filled how does this put you in a better position to be able to carry services so I'll start with that uh, council member so the first thing we do is if we have a job class that we have numerous positions in different locations I do meet with the administrative staff as well as our uh, newly regional manage managers to find out where the need is just in case we don't have enough individuals on that recruitment to fill so we do prioritize that way to ensure that we do uh, meet the needs of that particular branch based on their operational needs so that is done for each job class, and this is prior to me sending up the job offer for the position to be announced. So we already know that prior to. So we do that all up front. Over. So um, the bulk of these positions are direct customer service. So these are positions that will be in the branches, either from the information staff, the librarians and library associates, or the um, clear the circulation staff, the library assistants. Um, you can see as you look at the list, uh, we did a, doing a big push for the library assistants. These are also part-time positions. When we began our um, very robust push towards taking care of our vacancy issue, we triaged the jobs. We began, of course, with the full-time positions, moving down through the part-time to the lower level positions because that also affords promotional opportunities to our internal staff to move up into um, a different type of job. Um, there are a few other positions on here, not many, that are administrative. We have created another uh, position in our HR unit in order to continue this work. Um, and then there are a couple things from Ms. Brown's unit in collection management, um, but the bulk the, the main bulk of them, I would say probably, what, 80, 90 percent are direct public service. Gotcha. Um, and then obviously this is a success story, no question, because most of the other departments in county government are struggling um, to fill positions. And so I would hope that means that we're paying uh, really competitive salary and compensation as compared to other library systems, which I'm sure plays a role in it. Plus, obviously, the tremendous reputation we have, and we have beautiful facilities um, that are really extraordinary, which I'm sure helps with recruitment as well. Um, because this is the only addition to the library's budget, I agree with the flipping. High priority doesn't mean it's still making it through, because <laughs> it still has to compete with everything else, but it obviously puts it in a better position to at least have the conversation internally within the council, and I think this warrants at least being in that conversation. So I will support um, that um, change um, as reflected in the budget, but acknowledge there are going to be tough decisions that we make. But I will ask, if if you had to, if you didn't have a full 825, and you don't have to give me an answer right now, if it were split, say, in half to 400 or some derivation of that 825. I'd be curious in a follow-up to see, you know, what what would be great uh, and what not, because again, it's that's a big number uh, when when we go back and look at all of the other numbers that we're going to have to look at. So some way to bring that down a bit would be helpful. I yield back to you, lead for libraries, Councilmember Mink. That's me. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is there anything that anyone else would like to add to this conversation? I include uh, council staff in that, but as well as all of our, our friends from the library and uh, Kenobi, yeah. Um, you know, to council member Alvernaz's point, yes, um, 800,000 plus is a large number. Um, for us, this enhances our ability to move forward with plans that we want to put in place. Um, because of the nature of library work, although you know, certainly there have been technological changes and improvements and we have made use of many of those, the self-charge machines that we have in all of our buildings, um, other um, things that we have implemented, but when you get right down to it, it is still a human heavy and human centered service that we provide to the community. So um, the importance of being able to fully staff allows us the ability to, for example, program for teens, uh, for workforce, 
for the digital literacy um, programs that we want to be able to do because um, when libraries are open to the public, of course, our service desks need to be staffed. And I know you've heard um, from community members and also from uh, some library employees regarding that. So um, I just am um, very hopeful that uh, the recommendation will be for the full amount of the, as you noted, Council Member Amnaz, the reduction in our laps um, so that we can continue to hire and move forward with the plans that we have in place. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I mean, if this doesn't happen, then we of course will forge on, but it, it will restrict our ability to do what we have said we were going to do, so. Thank you. Yes, Ms. John. And then I'll turn it to Church Wanda. Um, just an additional thought after the GEO committee yesterday, um, Councilmember Stewart mentioned that departments that score highly on racial equity and social justice ratings should be invested in. And I want to highlight that uh, libraries from the get go, from 2019 when the law was passed, has been the leading department on doing this work. Um, their racial equity core team is extremely strong, um, gives a lot of input, and was involved involved in the stakeholder engagement of the strategic plan. I think that that's valuable context and insight. I would certainly not be opposed um, actually to, to keeping both of these as high priority myself. Um, it's $100,000 in, in, a, in the context of a very large budget that can go a very long way uh, you know, to do a lot for the community and to address our uh, racial equity and social justice goals. Um, I know that there's a lot of conversation um, amongst council members to, uh, you know, improve our outreach uh, to, you know, to a, to a more diverse community on our side. So making sure that we, that there's, you know, language access uh, for folks to be able to engage in the legislative process and policy making and receiving access to all of our services. Um, and this is a, this is a piece of that. Um, and so this also did, you know, I will say that when I mentioned, you know, high priority, I didn't necessarily mean striking uh, uh, the, um, the World Languages Collection from the high priority list. I think that's worth a conversation about the return on investment that comes for that as well. And I think that you raise a good point about um, what a point of pride <clears throat> this is already for us here. And if this is what it takes to, you know, put us, keep us at the forefront of that work, which is so closely aligned um, with goals that are clearly a high priority to us on the council. I think that that's a conversation worth having. I pass it to Chair Joanna. Thank you. Um, just on the 825 for the hiring, uh, I, I agree, as I said before, we should make that a high priority in its totality. Um, one of the things that I always want to remind folks is that the library's percentage of the budget is is so so much smaller and that and while this is a significant number it's to something that is working right you know like you're you are hiring we want labs to go down we just we sent a letter to the county executive the council president did uh or was about to i don't know if it went out yet but we're i hope i'm not breaking news but that to ask about vacancies and the potential to eliminate positions as a cost saving measure in this budget um and because of the lapse that's higher in so many other departments, as uh, Councilmember Alvarez mentioned, here it's actually the, the thing that we want to happen is happening. You're asking, you're saying, please lower the lapse because we've been so successful in hiring and we have these services to deliver. And, and to your point, I mean, I think libraries are a perfect example in the fact that most of these are front service, you know, customer, resident engaging positions. Uh, we don't want that to stop. So I, I, um, I think if, you know, we there will be larger discussions. Again, this just gets it on the list as a high priority. We're gonna have to figure it out. But you all are so um, such a vital and and frankly a small part of the budget. Um, I would hope that we could look other places to to uh, to get savings. Um, on the question of the high uh, the priority level for world languages, I think you know it is in the same vein. Why I know that's I want to give you an opportunity to speak to that. The mighty collections uh, and uh, management division, which I've, it's a cool place. If you haven't been there, you should, it's like where all the magic happens. And um, so I, I, you should make your case and talk about the, the need there. But um, I, I do think that we probably should, to, to give our colleagues a shot here and 
and do our part, uh, you know, I, I think I would su initially support making that a priority, even though I know it's it, it, these are all high priorities in, in the meaning of the word. So I uh, just wanted to give you an opportunity, and to, then I'll turn back to Chair, uh, just what, what that would go to and what the need is. Sure. So as you saw at Potomac at the reopening, um, they have a pretty extensive Chinese collection at that particular branch, but it is very old. And all of our World Languages collections have been sadly not gotten enough attention over the years, and they need redevelopment. Um, what $100,000 would do for our World Languages collection with this focus on Spanish and Chinese would provide approximately 150 titles for 10 libraries in each of those languages. It's not a lot um, when you look at you know the grand scheme of things, but it is a step in the right direction. And if we could get that funding and then repeat it year after year, we could build something really fantastic. Appreciate it. Back to you. Are there any other uh, questions or comments? All right. Now what? <laughs> Without objection, we're going to move forward with uh, with high priority and priority for the. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll do the flip then, and we'll continue this this conversation um, at at the council. Um, <clears throat> much like how something being on high priority doesn't mean we're going to get it, we're going to have to go forward and make our case. Something being on the being on the priority list also doesn't mean that we're not going to get it. Um, and uh, and and. You know, again, $100,000, I think that there is a, a case to be made here. Um, we do need to fight first to make sure that we get the staffing, um, but this is a conversation that is that is to be continued. So without objection? Without objection. Well, thank, thank you. you. Great job. Um, and good to see you all, and I think with that, you all are relieved. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Uh, next, we're going to move to our uh, fourth item, uh, the Tacoma Park Library Payment NDA, uh, and for that item, should be a quick item, I think we have some of our Tacoma, great friends at the Tacoma Park Library, which I often remind people, if you check a book out at the Tacoma Park Library, you have to bring it back to the Tacoma Park <laughs> Library. <laughs> um, it, while they are great partners of MCPL, they, they are their own entity. Uh, so I think that's Miss Jessica Jones under the under the uh, mask there. Good to see you. Uh, anyone else from your team? You know, you can keep it on if you, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No pressure. Um, so, and we have Miss Deborah Lambert and Carolyn, Miss Carolyn Chen again. Uh, I'll just turn it over to you, Miss Jones, if you have any comments you want to make and then we can go into the packet. Uh, sure. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you um, for giving us a chance to give some feedback. Uh, and as you said, we are our own entity. It's sort of a unique situation. Um, but one of the things that we do as a result of that at the Tacoma Park, Maryland Library is emphasize complementing uh, county services rather than duplicating them. Um, so we have several areas of emphasis that we've really been working on in the last couple of years. Um, this is, I'm just starting my third year there. So uh, we have been doing a lot of evaluating our programs. But uh, world language collection development has been a really big thing for us, as it has been with the county system. Um, our bilingual Spanish and French language librarians on staff have been doing a fantastic job of getting new Spanish and French language materials for us. And actually, our Spanish language uh, collection development initiative has been especially successful. Uh, we spent $15,000 on Spanish language materials this fiscal year, thanks to a grant from ALA. Uh, but of course, we'll need more funds in the future to continue these efforts at a robust level. Uh, but we've uh, found some cool new resources for untranslated works, uh, as we've had all of this money to spend this fiscal year on Spanish language materials, and then of course with our uh, bilingual uh, Spanish, English, and culturally competent librarian that's been spearheading those efforts, uh, which includes even working with bookstores in Latin American countries, uh, which has been really great. We have one in Argentina we've been working with that has even been putting together like themed lists for us um, of things that are published there and in South America. Uh, so, and, and I do think it's important to collect things that are originally written uh, in, in a language rather than focusing on translated works. Uh, but yeah, so we've also been doing a lot of bilingual English and Spanish programming, including some new efforts that are coming up. Uh, El Cuento is a new program for children using the game Loteria 
to teach Spanish language vocabulary in an engaging way. And uh, the way that we have approached this program is a little unique in that we've recruited Spanish speaking volunteers, many of whom are local parents, and they're gonna be running the program like on a day-to-day -day level, uh, which we're really excited about. It creates a lot of buy-in and community investment, um, and it also works well for us in terms of promoting it. Um, we're also working with performers to have a reliable and engaging presence at the Crossroads Farmers Market in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads area. Uh, which has been great, and we have started a Dia de los Niños program initiative, so we've got a lot of Spanish language programming on April 29th this year uh, that we plan on doing in the future as well. Uh, and then just a couple more things uh, related to our unique funding situation. Um, as the only public municipal library in Maryland, we're not eligible for state library support. So all of our funding comes from the city of Tacoma Park, uh, the county reimbursement and any grants we're able to secure. Uh, and while grants are wonderful, they're not necessarily reliable sources of funding and they typically support individual initiatives rather than operational expenses. Uh, we do have a very active friends group, uh, but those revenues are not typically high enough for us to be able to count on them to support operational expenses. Uh, they support individual programs and um, our interim location during construction is at the border with Prince George's County. Uh, so additional revenue would allow us to be a little bit more flexible with the cost of issuing library cards to non-residents, uh, especially our Spanish speaking patrons, many of whom live right on that border and closer to us than any of the PG County libraries. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, and you, you all are in a unique location and you, you, as you just emphasized, sir, unique population. You have one of the best children's rooms around. And, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my, my kids love it. Um, Ms. Chen, do you want to add anything there? Uh, yes, I just want to note that the discussion item today mainly is to approve the county executive budget as submitted because it is uh, bound by law, um, a, a law that hasn't changed in a couple of decades. So the discussion going forward for the next fiscal year would be uh, to see what we could do in terms of reviewing that calculation. Um, currently, it, uh, we're looking at a $4,500 increase from last year, and last year was an eight thousand dollar decrease that's all a calculation based on um, taxable assessment of city of Tacoma um, I wanted to note that the Tacoma Park Library and Community Center renovation to be open fall 2024 hopefully um, is a, a massive undertaking that the city of Tacoma Park has secured bond bills for and fundraised for so any investment to the Tacoma Park library system would be leveraged heavily um, and then final point, I want to thank Director Jones for coming this morning. We were at the City of Tacoma uh, City Council meeting last night, you till 11, me till 1030. It was fascinating um, to understand the budget. So I really uh, just want to thank you for allowing me to understand a little bit more about how the municipality works. Um, and so what I learned was we are the only source of revenue and funding for the Tacoma Park Library in their $1.4 million budget at this time. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, the recommendation here, and colleagues, uh, turn to Councilmember Mink first to have any questions, but just to be clear, uh, Ms. Chen, the recommendation is a $4,500 five increase uh, to be put on the reconciliation list as a high priority, and you provided the really important context that that is half of the decrease from last year, mm -hmm. so it's still, still not uh, making a hole, and you're, and you're using it well. So. Uh, Thank you. Yes, I would. I would uh, concur with the assessment that that is a high priority, and that looking at that calculation uh, is something that we need to do moving forward. Um, I just wanted to, if you wouldn't mind, um, Director Jones, giving telling us a little bit more about your World Language Program, about the benefits that you see for the library and for the community. As you can, as you uh, heard, we're going to have some decisions to make around that program for MCPL. Um, so insights about uh, the benefits there in taking on, you know, racial equity and social justice goals and, um, and, and uh, being an anti-racist library and connecting with your com community and all of those things. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, why you have um, leaned into investment in that area. Uh, is it working and so on? Uh, sure, I, I, it's a really important initiative for us. Uh, if the idea of cultural competence is 
uh, certainly one that we really try to embrace in Tacoma Park. And uh, to that end, I, I think that a lot of this shift in our world language collection development has uh, also been tied up with our recruiting efforts. Because uh, I think that when you recruit more diversely, your collection inherently also becomes more diverse. Uh, You're talking because, about recruiting staff? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's always going to be a reflection of who's on staff. And I, I think that there's a lot that you can do uh, to try to evaluate and balance what you're doing, but uh, I, I don't know that that is ever going to be a substitute for having a staff that reflects the community that they're serving. Um, and I know with this last um, round of recruitment that we went through for a new youth services manager, one of the things that I did was actually remove the, uh, the MLS requirement for the position uh, and would accept equivalent experience or education. And uh, it's we, we have a bit of a non-traditional candidate that's serving in that role, but she hit the ground running and has been doing an amazing job setting up community partnerships um, and uh, creating new programs, and then of course with our collection development. And she's actually the one that secured the ALA grant uh, for our Spanish language collection development. Uh, and as a native Spanish speaker, she has been able to do networking with bookstores and other entities in Latin American countries that nobody else on staff uh, was really able to do with the success that she has had. Um, I, and I think it's also important for us um, just to make sure that our collections do reflect the people that come and visit. I think that there's a difference in the concepts of inclusion and belonging. And we're, we're really trying to uh, achieve as much belonging as we can, which means people need to be able to see themselves uh, in our books and things that are on the shelves, but also with who's behind the desk when they're asking questions, because uh, that's a big part of what helps people to feel comfortable asking questions and engaging with us and expressing needs so that we can understand what sort of uh, responsive services we can offer them in turn. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, re and you were saying, were you saying that having the, um, the world language collection as part of that mm -hmm. um, helped you to diversify in recruitment or that that was or that diverse recruitment helped you to diversify your collection more effectively i think the diverse recruitment helped us with the collection development that's helpful thank you sure guys want to say anything no all right so with uh without objection i think we'll add that 4505 to the priority high priority list <laughs> thank you and we'll, we'll see you soon Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to the ribbon cutting and the opening of the the, the center, you know, next year. Okay. Uh, and with that, we are going to move on to our fifth item today, which is the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County. So, Ms. Susan Jenkins, Chief, and uh, is Elisa Alicia Singh. Did I say that right? All right, from O and B. Good morning. Well, we always are happy to see you, Miss Jenkins. Thank you for for being here. <laughs> We've got a, a little prop there. Okay, that's all right. There you go. We'll figure it out. You know, arts are important. Arts are jobs. Is that what it says? All right, got it. I, you got it on the you got it on the record. You got it on the record. <laughs> And uh, good to see you as always, and really, really appreciate all the work uh, that you've done uh, since you've been at the Arts and Humanities Council, but Thank especially you. during the pandemic. Thank you. Um, and uh, arts are jobs, and arts are also mental health, and arts are uh, uh, can building community. Arts are many things. And, right. uh, and so we, as you know, uh, as the returning member of the previous Education and Culture Committee, we always really had a strong emphasis and investment in the work that you've done and so we'd just love to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, how things are going and, and what you see and then we'll turn to the packet and obviously I know there's there's a request here that we will get to get into thank you so for, I guess for the record I'm Susan Jenkins I'm the CEO of the Arts and Humanities Council and thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak with me today about um, our NDA and the work that we do in the community. 
So since 1976, the Arts and Humanities Council has existed as the designated local arts agency of Montgomery County. So we're doing the work for the county to go out and to make sure that we're serving all of the residents. And I'm really, really proud, as you mentioned, Councilmember Jawando, that during the uh, pandemic, we were really able to deepen the impact of our work um, as through our partnership with Montgomery County all together. And the county council was um, stalwart in your support and also focused in the support. And so I really appreciate that. I won't go through all of our history. I think you all know us well enough to know that. But just to simply say that recovery has been challenging. You know, as we said at the beginning and all of the news reports that you've read, everything you know about cities and counties around the nation, arts were first to close because of the proximity of the nature of the work we do and the last to open. And so the long tail of the pandemic has been still deep for us. And while many, many, many organizations around the nation did not flourish, I'm very proud to say that because of the work that the county council has done and the county government in Montgomery County, we've had very few organizations that have been lost to the pandemic. I'm super proud of that. One of the things, though, is that when we first began talking about the pandemic and the impact on the community, and we received ARPA funds from the county, that helped us reach out to new communities who may not beforehand needed our support. What do I mean by that? Well, um, I'd say that um, there are communities around, creative communities around, in and around the uh, region where we've had lots and lots of retirees, lots and lots of artists, lots and lots of creatives um, all around the region who were practicing their art, practicing the humanities, practicing their work without the support of county government because they were doing well. But the pandemic hit everyone. And so if you have an artist who may be working in the region, who also may be waiting tables or having another job when they're not working their regular acting or performing jobs, well, you had to do both, but during the pandemic you could do neither. So the long tail of what has hit this community is really difficult. And I'm talking about not just creatives as you may think them, actors or voiceover uh, artists, but it could be carpenters, electricians, um, anyone who is building sets, designers, that type of thing. And the long tail for this community who often um, is just under the ranks for health care, needing of affordable housing, that kind of thing. That community has still been inordinately affected by the pandemic. That's why I'm coming to you today, and that's why in my request, um, based on what we saw, those newcomers who came into um, our portfolio that we hadn't seen before, and we said, here we're here to help you and to serve you. Now we are seeing that they need our support. So I'm coming to you today to say the community has told us that they need our support. We're a data-driven agency. We've provided a lot of information in our both our testimony and in our letters to you um, stating what demand looks like. And so we are simply asking that we meet the demand for the residents, that we are able to stabilize those, long, those larger organizations who are able to employ more and that we are able to support those who have just come into our ranks from what we see are traditionally under-resourced communities. One of the things that we talked about in uh, when I gave my written testimony was a preponderance of funds that the community has been investing over the years in one or two major zip codes in the area. But what we see is growth, and in our work through with MNC PPC and the Thrive 2050 plan, we know that growth, growth is expanding, and that's why we're doing some work with Up County, Mid County, Wheaton, so that we can meet meet and reach these traditionally under-resourced communities. So that's what I'm talking about. Asking for support for those that we brought into the ranks during the pandemic. We said, look, we want you here. We want you to, to keep you here. One of the things, Councilmember Mink, that you talked about was retention and attraction. You know, bringing in creative workforce to what we're doing here in Montgomery County. You know, we're not a, we're not a, industrial type city. We're, a, we're an intellectual uh, community where we have a lot, a lot of people 
were doing both blue and white collar jobs, to use a very old term. So now when we see these communities growing, we have to meet them where we are, meet these creatives where we are, and retain them. So what we're asking for is that kind of support. I also want to mention that um, as an agency, that we're part of the ecosystem of education and culture that we just saw this morning. Specifically, Arts and Humanities Council over many, many years has attracted interns from Montgomery College. They come into our agency, we teach them about what we do, we send them off into the world, they go to a four-year college, they've come back, they've gotten jobs. So when I talk about retention and attraction, these are the things that make communities great. You know, when, when we also think about um, what attracts people, having lived overseas a good portion of my life and then come back to the States, I know that the things that attracted my family to the area were not great roads and not great parking lots, but quality of life factors that we offer here in Montgomery County. We want to continue to be able to do that. We need your support. We're asking for $1.1 million to meet the demand that we saw, and we're also asking for your consideration of any um, uh, remaining uh, Recovery Act funds that might be available of $3.6 million. I know it's a lot, but I'm hoping you do, can do some because we see that there's still a lot of pain in the community. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins, and appreciate uh, all the work that you've done and are doing. Uh, I, before I turn to colleagues, I just have, I would like to hear from OMB, you know, the rationale of the recommendation here uh, you know, this is effectively a cut um, in, you know, the way it works out in my mind. So I just want to, I, I know there were some things that were moved to the base budget that used to be funded um, out of Arts and Humanities, like kid museums, that we're all supportive of that. But if you could just speak to the rationale of, to the extent that you can, of the county executive's proposal here. Good morning. <clears throat> so um, the CE's recommendation, due to the fiscal constraints, it kind of um, sort of all the funds were absorbed. So the recommendation, so the FY23 recommendation, it did include a six six 631,000 increase, which that included 8% in, inflationary adjustment as well as the 175. So there was limited funds to a lot to this organization for the FY24 budget. So the, the recommendation only included the 3% inflationary increase. Okay, appreciate you explaining that. Um, Ms. Chen, do you want to provide any more further context and then we'll turn to colleagues? Uh, yes, and um, just on this item, we'll, uh, we'll clear this up first. Um, thank you, Alicia, so much. We've been working uh, together to um, by clarity. Uh, so what you're looking at is uh, a correction that we'll need to make. Um, the 175,000 one-time elimination, um, that was actually used in the calculation in fiscal year 23 for the 184,000 inflationary increase. So it includes it um, and then it took it out which gave it an effective 0.2% increase. So what we're actually starting with is um, 6,339,106 6, approved for 23, and then ending with a recommended fiscal year 24 of 6,524,021 uh, and that is on the first page. So it's actually, I would consider it a technical correction as opposed to a reduction um, that we start with the 6.5 number through this discussion uh, just because of the, the way that this was laid out. So the number that is in the executive's budget is the 6,524, which is the 3%, is what you're describing as the 3% inflation. Just help me understand. So the 6,339. 106 is what happened in 23, so that's the baseline for this discussion. Anything above that would be on the reconciliation list under the rules that were put forward this year. And so what is the executive proposed? So the proposal is the 184.923. Okay. And then this 175 is? So that's the elimination of the one-time adjustment made in FY23. Okay. And and so that you get the total of 6,524. 
it's actually it's a mis it's a mistake. Got it. So, yeah. so what we want to do is just pretend that 175 is not there. The 100 we're talking 20, 184. That's the three percent inflationary increase. That is what we're discussing today to put on the reconciliation. Got it. Thank okay. You. And then Ms. Uh, Jenkins, you're saying great for that, but that's not enough. And you, is your 1.1 million number on top of that, or is that inclusive of that? That would be inclusive. Okay, so it'd be more like nine hundred something. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay, I see nodding. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want to turn to colleagues uh, before I make a suggestion. I won't. Do, I'll, I'll do that first. But um, you know, I I know how many artists and others that you've helped, and big or institutions that you've helped, and small arts institutions that you've helped, and. As you said, the tail on this for those institutions has been long. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, even for some of our big, big organizations like the BSO, you know, right. other places, you know, there's efforts, you know, to get people back, and uh, and you know, and, it, and it's challenging, but it's also necessary. So I, I understand the the need. Obviously, it's a tough budget, but this is an important part of our quality of life here. To your point, um, so I, I'll, I'll hold on making the recommendation. And, and colleagues, do you have anything you want to add? Okay, she's got a cackle. Do you want to say anything, Councilor Alwin? Yeah, a couple things. So, uh, well, it's great to see you, Ms. Jenkins, as always. Um, great to see you too. You gotta check. You might be the longest serving director, <laughs> of um, but which is extraordinary. You, you've done a lot of really great things. Um, so, and a I, pandemic and a major yeah, economic downturn. <laughs> all of it. All of it. So. Um, I, I think I was following the bouncing ball, uh, more or less, but I'm going to focus for purposes of my comments on the additional money on top of what the adjustment we, we just talked about. So I, we, we did invest, um, as we should have, uh, throughout the pandemic to sustain and build a bridge for our incredible arts-based organizations of all sizes, of all scopes, um, to be able to, to get to the other side. and. The good news is they're getting to the other side. While recovery has been slow, um, I've been immensely impressed um, with what I've seen and the incredible creativity, um, the thoughtful leveraging of public-private partnerships that has, uh, you know, happened, and we have to keep that momentum going. Um, I'm not sure I would support the full 900,000, and I'm gonna, opening it up for Chair Dewanda when he comes back in uh, to give him uh, teeing this up for him. Um, but I think, not unlike libraries, our last conversation, it should be part of the conversation uh, as we have to make difficult decisions um, to be able to build off of the successes that we have had. Because as we've talked about many times before, uh, you can draw a straight line between the success of these organizations in economic development. Absolutely. You can draw a straight line between the success of these organizations and our improved mental health of our entire community. and. Um, the fastest growing demographic we have in our community is our aging population, who is in a better position to take advantage of these incredible programs and services and facilities that we've been trying to build off of for generations now. So, um, and that, that improves quality of life in many different ways. So I would support bringing that down on some level, um, you know, in, in, for consideration, um, and then I'm working on something that isn't ready for prime time yet um, to try and lift all boats, but um, more to come on that. Uh, but in the meantime, I think this this should be something that we should consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Alvarez. Um, do you want to speak, Councilor Mick, or do you want to make my um, Go ahead, Councilor Mick. Okay, sorry. I just I got my calculator out. <laughs> just making sure I understand. Okay, so I can see if we do if we take the um, approved FY twenty three and we take away the one seventy five, which should not have been done, um, and then uh, you add three percent, then that's how we get to the FY twenty four CE recommended, which of um, six million three forty nine uh, and twenty nine dollars. Um, if we take the original FY23 um, and just do a straight up 3% um, addition to that, um, then we get 6,529,279. Am I looking at the right numbers here? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we're looking at numbers then on top of that 6.529. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Mink. So yes, that's correct. So I think what I'd like to propose uh, is that we uh, put the 184,000, the, the amount, the 3% increase on the reconciliation list as a high priority, and then put um, three tranches of $300,000 uh, on the reconciliation list as a high priority, realizing that um, that's responsive to your, those numbers together will get at what you're asking for, uh, but knowing that we're going to have to take that in totality and in consideration in the reconciliation list, uh, but it is it is an important priority and it should be discussed at that level, I believe. So uh, that would be my proposal if that's clear to Ms. Chen. So I think that would that would uh, without objection is that without objection. So we will add uh, this take the C's increase as one bucket and then the three tranches of three hundred thousand above that. Thank you, Council Member. And I'm just going to note that that is to allow us for the for the millions who are always watching when uh, Chair Juwanda was chair. Um, <laughs> um, that that just gives us options when we when we come to the reconciliation table at the full council to be able to look at the totality of um, of the of the reconciliation list and have this a menu of one, two, or three tranches to be able to to work with. Just to clarify, thanks. Jenkins, anything you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to oh, thank, thank you, you for that. I think that that's a wonderful strategy and, and much appreciated because I think uh, when we're considering those most vulnerable, even you know, this, a, a couple of tranches will help us meet these new um, smaller uh, organizations and individual artists and scholars who are still struggling. You know, and I still I I, I want to note that we still know that over eighty percent of the organizations in the entire portfolio are still not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. So when you consider that much of a devastation in the community anything will help and I appreciate your good thoughts on this thank you thank you Ms. Jenkins and thank you for all your work um, thank you. and we will see you again soon absolutely right. thank you okay we'll move move to our uh, final item today uh, which is uh, Mikhail and uh, their operating budget and I see our executive director Ms. Kathy Stevens here and I think Deborah Lambert is back for another appearance for an encore uh, Mikhail stands for the Montgomery Coalition for Adult English Literacy and uh, great organization. And thank you as well from OMB. Yeah, yep. Just want to, as you're sitting down, Ms. Stevens, just want to thank you for all the work that you do uh, to work with our population on English literacy you know we and through a racial equity lens and just really help empower communities um, this is a really is has been and continues to be a, an innovative way um, in a training program that builds a pipeline of folks that are involved in our community for a long time uh, we just had the wallet hub rankings again we are now all f we have four in the top ten now I just saw you know used to have three in the top ten cities of the most diverse in the country and now all four with uh, Gaithersburg reclaiming the top spot uh, from Germantown and uh, and Rockville and Silver Spring and Rockville fall, not falling far behind. So uh, just a, a testament to the, the more than third of our population who are foreign born who avail themselves of your services. So just want to provide you an opportunity to make any opening comments. Thank you, Chair Jawando, and thank you, Council Members Alpernas and Mink. It's nice to be here. Uh, and. Uh, be able to share with you uh, some of our work and some of our needs. Um, I'll go ahead and just say thank you on behalf of our coalition of over 11,000 learners, uh, over somewhere over a thousand instructors, program managers, all the people who structure those programs, and then of course all of the people who benefit from that those English learners, whether it's their children, their employers, uh, even going to their doctor. It makes the doctor's visit uh, easier. As you know, English is the key that people need to be able to communicate and live their lives and accomplish their goals. And it's the cornerstone for success. 
and as a cornerstone for so many of the other things that we've talked about today. I've been sitting in on the, the work session and Mikhail, as you know, fills the pipelines for our future workers, for our, our parents, for our future uh, residents. And not only that, but when you have a better level of English, you're more able to participate in community, as we all do, in your job, as a parent, as a community member. So it is our belief that English can be that on-ramp to uh, a better life and perhaps using less social services and participating more in our community. Um, just a couple quick points, if I may make, before Ms. Chen goes through the packet. Just a couple numbers I want to raise to your attention today. They're front and center in my communications to you all. The number of uh, folks who self-identify through our American Community Survey as less than less than proficient, uh, let, speak English less than very well. The, the, the nomenclature is less uh, limited English proficiency. We don't love using that because it talks about a deficit basis, but um, that's the, the terminology yeah, from this. It's one the of census. the many things I want to change about the way we define things. Yes, yeah. we're yeah. with you on that, and we're already working to change our, our language on that. Uh, that number, most recent data available is 2021 ACS, American Community Survey, shows 134,000 adults. That goes up steadily since 2018. We've been watching the data, about 2,000 adults each year. And yet we know that doesn't probably capture everyone, right? Because we have um, more recent refugees and immigrants that are in our community. So that's one number. The other number is 11,515. Right now we're serving about 11,000 adults all told, not just in our grant uh, program. That's through non-funded programs, faith-based organizations. Certainly we count the college numbers, Gilchrist numbers in that. This is the first year our grant applicants, we had grant applications due about a week or so ago, first year that they have said they are ready, willing, and able, if they have the funding, to serve over 11,000 adults. So that would be in grant-funded programs, plus all the other people we, we reach through our trainings and through our uh, professional development, technical assistance, and all of that. Um, and then three other quick numbers are um, the numbers that we wish to bring up uh, our hourly uh, pay for instructors, and we want that to go to, oh my gosh, $17 an hour for the someone with not a lot of experience, $21 and $29 an hour. It's basically a $2 an hour increase. We have not recommended these increases in our grants funded programs since before the pandemic, since about 2019. It's time. These are not career launching jobs, but this is part of our equity plan. We first had an equity plan in 2019. We went through the Leadership Montgomery program. We have just done a new uh, strategic plan that fully incorporates our equity goals, not only internally for our board, for our grants panel, for our staff, but also for the people in the coalition. We have a great new uh, project, it's not so new, it's about 18 months underway, community learning groups. Two major goals, one to reach new learners in new communities, whether geographic or ethnic or language-based, and to reach new instructors, to train instructors who have, who are immigrants themselves, recent immigrants themselves, have lived ESOL experience, they're English language learning learners themselves, and this is part of our equity plan. Um, for many years, the instructors, all wonderful and all good and talented in the coalition, have been mostly people who look like me, a little older than me maybe, but middle-aged white women, and we wanna make sure that we are building equity in our teacher base and our instructors, our programs are always saying, we need more instructors, we need more instructors. So we are working to meet that need with new trainings. Um, and I will say our data, I put some of it in our packet, happy to answer any questions. But we also have a great employee who just gave me yesterday a map uh, that overlays our class locations and our community learning group locations with the county's equity need, high equity need areas. We are squarely in all of those and targeting those for our new community learning groups, new funding, and we've been working with places like the Islamic, Soci Islamic Society of Washington, ha having class there for women who can't go elsewhere for their classes, recent uh, Muslim uh, arrivals. We have been working with a Chick-fil-A, or had worked with a Chick-fil-A in East County. They, the owners there sponsored uh, classes, a couple classes for their employees. 
we're with parent groups at Watkins Mill. We're with other another group of parents um, through a nonprofit, a small nonprofit in Germantown, where the children are coming for reading enhancement while the parents are waiting. We were able to do a community learning group for the English for them. So. Um, you won't be surprised to hear we've got good data, we've got outcomes that we track, as you all know, not only for the coalition, for the programs, for the instructors, for the learners, um, and all of that data I'm happy to talk about. Uh, we just know that we need to remain a high priority on this reconciliation list. You've learned well from the previous items, <laughs> um, Ms. Stevens. Thank, no, thank you for uh, that update, uh, I've, I've, I've heard about that program that you started at ISWA, which is the Islamic Center in Briggs Cheney there uh, in East County. Um, it's one of the examples of many great programs that you all are running um, and with the trainers. Um, so just, I'll turn it to Ms. Chen momentarily. Uh, just to, my understanding here is that the, there's a 7.7% 7, uh, increase proposed by county executive that would take you from the FY23 approved of 2, 2100000 13623 to 2277032 and then you are requesting uh, an additional 35000 on top of that uh, to serve more learners and do the programming uh, and give those wage increases that you just mentioned. Um, Ms. Chen, anything you want to add before we make a recommendation? Also evoking another council member from yesterday's DO committees, um, council member Kat said all these NDAs are a bargain. So I just want to make the point, <laughs> I just want to make a point that um, Mikhail, which I promised that we will hype you up because it's always listed on the, bu the last item for, for budget. But um, we need to move you up next year. Yeah, we're gonna, it's just really not fair. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yes, I know. She sits through the whole thing. Remember we're on Zoom and it all. Anyway, so um, that the entire target population and demographic that Mikhail works with um, is, is um, uh, in need and you can track the progress. Um, in addition, I do think a, a, an, an ESOL um, instructor is career changing. So I do want to push to push to push that anything that you to show that you have two different groups. We're t instructing and training teachers, and we're also um, empowering community-based organizations. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Uh, Councilman Rawanas. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. It's great seeing you. Um, really appreciate your continued leadership. Just fun fact, Ms. Stevens and I rode next to each other on an airplane to El Salvador when we went on the Sister City program, um, which was uh, pretty, pretty fantastic. So yeah. thrilled you're in this position, thrilled with Thank the continued you. progress. And it was, you guys recently celebrated a significant anniversary. 15 and then, years, yeah. yeah then and I, I'm getting up ready to have my 11th anniversary with the organization. That is incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. So, uh, and, and just a sign of what this council is, can do. Uh, this was created by then council member Tom Perez. Um, and so, you know, that legacy is really extraordinary on so many different levels. And I support um, the, this particular recommendation. And again, this also should be part of that conversation as we make tough decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, council member May. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just wanted to note that looking through all of the data that you provided uh, in, in our conversations that we've had prior to this, um, I really am just so impressed uh, the level of accountability and transparency uh, and through the just really effective data collection that you all have done um, is it would be great to have this for every single program that we I mean we've been talking about this a lot on this committee uh, about what we want to see from you know all these different nonprofits from NCPS from all you know all the different programs so that we can really make um, responsible decisions um, so this is a really helpful model to have it really shows what good use you're making of the funding um, and uh, one thing from our conversation that I wanted to note also is, uh, you know, the needs in East County, of course, as we look at uh, the diversity there and, um, and recent arrivals uh, and the many different languages that are that are represented, um, I I'm excited to do more in District 5 with you all. And I know that you all are also, uh, and some of what we were talking about, I'll just um, let uh, my colleagues know, is about um, 
reaching into the community and kind of starting there to stand up courses uh, and uh, you know finding instructors that come from within the community who are already you know a part of these uh, neighborhood ecosystems and community ecosystems and then really working with them in partnership to build out what should the program look like where should it be what's gonna you know and and that's really the the kind of, I mean I just think that that is fantastic leadership that's a great model um, and uh, and that's how we are going to get more people especially recent arrivals who who might not be comfortable working within our system yet, but that's how we're going to reach them and, and bring them in and provide job opportunities uh, to the instructors as well as to everybody who benefits from the courses. Um, so it's just a great model. I think it's really fundamental to the kind of expanded access um, and our, our racial equity and social justice goals that we have as a county. So um, I, I certainly support um, the recommendation, including uh, the additional requests that you've made. Thank you, and thank you, Council Member Mink. Sorry. Chair Jawando. Um, you know, I just wanted to tag on to that, that it's, it, we've been very clear about looking at our data and making decisions based on that where the need is. And certainly East County has been one of those areas for many years, which we've been looking at. And I think we've found a way now through these community learning groups. And then I hope to work with Montgomery College, of course, because then it's a pathway from us to the college or to other programs that can co-locate um, and it just makes all the sense in the world. We are not, of course, ignoring all the other high areas of need, Gaithersburg, Germantown, Rockville, Silver Spring, of course, um, and we've made it a, pri a priority for our, our grants um, decision making. And I will say we have the most diverse grants panel this year that we've ever had and I'm really thrilled about that. Councilman, or Chair Jawando, I'm so sorry I jumped in. No, 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 you just responded to a question, no problem. Were you done, Councilman May? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, Kind of a process question here. What I'd like to do, assume, and I think is consistent with the guidance we've been given, is I'd like to take the 163 and 35 and add them together into 198, 409, and just put that on, as opposed to breaking it up. Um, so, if colleagues are okay with that, um, so it would just be one. The recommendation from the committee, without objection, would be that to approve 198409 uh, uh, on the high priority list reconciliation list for McHale. That was my intention in framing it that way, so I thank you for that. Okay, good. Um, well, without objection, we'll do that, and thank you. And we're thank excited you. about the work that you are doing and will do. We're excited too, and to the point of being last on the agenda, I'm happy to give you back some time. Just to put a thought in your head, I would love to schedule a meeting in the fall where we'll, we have a McHale advisory group made up of instructors and, and program managers. We're also launching a learner leadership group. I think it would be an interesting work session or some sort of visit in the fall with the committee so that you don't just hear from me or some of our board members, but we hear from some of the people doing the work and um, receiving the work, if you will. So we, we we'll just put that as a, a point, to put a pin in it, as they say, and, we, we and thank find, you very much. Yeah, we will find time to do that, and I agree with Councilmember Katz 100%. We do get a bang for a buck with the NDAs. <laughs> I should be asking for more money then. <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Chen. Thank you, Ms. Lambert. With that, we are adjourned.